Hello. <laughs> Thank you for attending this webinar organized by academia.sg and hosted by Hong Kong Baptist University. My name is Tio Yu Yen. I'm one of the editors of academia.sg. This is an event both ordinary and extraordinary. Ordinary because this is the type of event the speakers have each been doing for years. We've all presented our research at roundtables and we have each spoken at events that are for public and not just for academic audiences. But this event is also obviously extraordinary. We don't normally do these talks from our individual homes. Most of you would not ordinarily sign up to hear a bunch of academics on a Friday night of a long weekend. And certainly amongst the more than 1,000 of you who have signed up to follow this webinar, we have never before had such a deeply shared context of crisis on this major and global scale. I think the motif of ordinary and extraordinary will serve us well tonight, as well as in the days ahead. It suggests that we have to be thinking about the past in, rela in relation to the present, but also about the present in relation to the future. We need to rely on what we know during ordinary times, but also challenge ourselves to reflect and respond and operate in new ways, given extraordinary ones. Keeping these two things in tension, we can hopefully use what we have to build what we need. Some of you sent questions when you registered for this webinar. Thank you for taking the trouble to do that. We looked at your questions in preparation for our conversation this evening. And we grouped your questions into three broad categories. In the first set of questions, you asked us to reflect on what we know to make sense of the ongoing crisis. You asked what we think of ongoing responses to and impacts of the crisis in the areas of politics, economy, and society. I will therefore ask my fellow panelists, as scholars of Singapore society, what are some issues and problems that you see manifesting in particular ways during this crisis? And through addressing this question, we will try to draw on the tools we've built during ordinary times to make sense of this extraordinary one. A second set of questions you send concerns the link between the present and the future. What can we expect the next weeks, months, and years to look like? What will the fallout of this crisis be? Importantly, you have also asked in various ways, how do we mitigate the negative impacts of the COVID-19 crisis? While we certainly cannot and should not presume that we can address this definitively, part of the purpose of this webinar and the work of academia.sg more generally is precisely to open up space to consider issues of mitigation and solutions. So I will also ask my fellow panelists to discuss what they are especially concerned about in terms of the fallout of this crisis and what lessons we can draw from theirs and others' research that can help us think through mitigation strategies in the days ahead. Finally, because we are academics and many of those who signed up tonight are students and academics, there is some interest in the role of scholars and scholarly research during these extraordinary times. More broadly than that, there's also interest in the question of how social change can come about and who gets to play a part in it. And so finally, I will ask the panelists to reflect on the question, what can we do as scholars, as civil society, as members of society? What can we do to generate the conditions we need for the changes we want to see? The format of the webinar is that we will each take a few minutes to address the first question and then open things up for a more free-flowing conversation about the second and third sets of questions. And if time permits, we'll take questions uh, from the audience. So let me start now by repeating that first question. As scholars of Singapore society, what are some issues and problems that you see manifesting in particular ways during this crisis? Sharon? Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, let me pick up on this paradox that you've highlighted of the uh, ordinary and the extraordinary. Uh, there's a related tension between the predicted and the unpredictable, and also between what's well-known and the unknown. 
the current crisis is, I think, yet another illustration of a universal problem that I've been writing about on and off for the last six, seven years. This uh, post-truth paradox of unknown knowns, where human society painstakingly builds immense knowledge about a problem, but then proceeds to behave as if we are clueless. Uh, human civilization has never been better informed as we are now uh, to solve big problems. Uh, but there's always a time lag, a sometimes fatal gap between what we know and what we actually act on. So I've personally been studying how hate merchants uh, take advantage of such gaps, though of course the most important case is a man-made climate change, a big gap between what we've known for a long time and what we still cannot bring ourselves to address. But this list includes the threat of global pandemics. Uh, no government has a right to claim ignorance. Uh, even before SARS-1, uh, this threat was on every list of global catastrophic risks that experts said people needed to prepare for. Uh, at the individual level, unfortunately, uh, humans are seriously stupid in our ability to comprehend risk. Uh, we worry about trivial things and don't pay attention uh, to many more serious ones. But that's no excuse because you know, even this, you know, this mental handicap within the human species is well known, uh, thanks to decades of research in psychology and the behavioral sciences. Um, how to compensate for our individual stupidity is also well known. Uh, history, social theory, political science uh, tell us that when we realize that we're prone to tendencies that might harm us, that's when we should be designing institutions that try to save us from ourselves. Uh, that includes government, of course, but also media, universities, uh, and others. So when I uh, try to think through this current crisis, one of the questions I'm intrigued by is that of institutional failure. Uh, how can our institutions globally and at home uh, do better at closing this gap between knowledge and action? Why have most countries, regardless of their political system, have been found wanting? I think this is a challenge that is much more than one of efficiency. It's not a technocratic issue. Uh, these are ultimately questions of morality and power. Uh, I say this because all our fields tell us that a key reason why this gap between knowledge and action persists is that the people with the most knowledge and the most power to act in every society are also the most privileged and they know that even if the ship is sinking there's still going to be a place on the lifeboat for them it's the same with pandemics for all the talk about COVID-19 as a great equalizer uh, we've come to learn that that's really not true uh, and I think it will be increasingly untrue as the crisis morphs from being a health crisis uh, to an economic crisis uh, that's it for me from now. Um, Kenneth? Yeah, uh, thanks, Charian. Um, so I, I work uh, in political science mainly, but also on the margins of cultural studies. And uh, I'm quite interested in seeing how the pandemic exposes the weaknesses of Singapore's more recent practices of authoritarianism, uh, which are much more subtle and sophisticated than the older, more explicitly brutal variety, but no less uh, debilitating. Uh, the way I try to understand Singapore's um, neo-authoritarian system today is to think about it as constituted by two tendencies that react against each other. The first tendency relates to what many of us refer to as neoliberal globalization, uh, fixation on the market and the permeation of economic and technocratic logic into all spheres of human activity, such as the social, the cultural, ethical, uh, aesthetic, and the political. When all that most of us can think about most of the time is making a profit uh, or competing against one another in a meritocratic scramble to the top of the hierarchy or treating economic growth as the nation's most important goal and the mistaken belief that it will naturally benefit everyone, including those who find themselves at the bottom of society. When we do all these things, uh, we limit our horizons of human experience, interdependency, and value. We limit our capacity for moral reasoning. We deny the power of imagination that can enable us to work practicably 
and um, collaboratively towards a more liberated, creative, empathetic, and equal society where everyone has an opportunity to flourish. In, fa in effect, we, we accept our infantilization and the impossibility of, of, of real growth. Now, the second tendency reacting against the extremes of neoliberal globalization is authoritarian populism. Uh, as more and more people get excluded from the benefits of neoliberal globalization and they feel uh, systematically disenfranchised, uh, resentment builds up against the elite who have treated everyone else with disrespect and even disdain. I'm especially interested in the way that moral panics are generated in such circumstances where the popular feelings of victimhood are galvanized and collectively channeled against scapegoats or, or, or folk devils, right? Who are misidentified as the root cause of a degenerative society. I think many of the phenomena associated with the coronavirus pandemic can be explained critically through this macro theoretical lens, the panic buying, the acts of public defiance and the bullying behavior triggered by them the racist and xenophobic speech and behavior in a society usually lauded for its multiracial harmony, and the unequal impact on those at the margins of society. Most spectacularly, perhaps, are the migrant workers whose large presence in Singapore reflects the increasing neoliberal demand for cheap, low-skilled workers, invisibly sustaining the myth of an economic miracle while efforts to contain and erase their bodily presence in normal times and the tendencies to pathologize them in times of crisis, the ordinary and the extraordinary, right, indicate the extent of resentment that Singaporeans feel about having to share their already crowded city and limited opportunities. I suspect that we need beyond all else to think in an enlarged way about what we should do about the deeper structural problems of an economy and society that have become so dependent on um, migrant labor. And I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. Okay. Hi. So the pandemic seems to have emphasized, highlighted issues which economists uh, in Singapore have been discussing for at least 10 years. Okay. So it's nothing new, it's just highlighted it. Two things in particular. One, the pandemic has revealed the hidden costs of our long established economic growth model, which we call an extensive model or an input intensive model, which is you increase inputs of capital and labor in order to produce more output. One corollary of this model is over-reliance on excessively labor intensive uh, methods of production in some sectors, uh, which are also correlated with low wages and low productivity growth that has been bothering us for years. A uh, second uh, issue that has been highlighted by the pandemic is the limits of our over-reliance, or heavy reliance, I should say, on uh, highly globalized sectors like export manufacturing, oil services, transport, travel, tourism, international finance, in an era when we've been experiencing deglobalization for at least a decade in terms of reduced growth in trade and investment. So we know deglobalization is occurring, there's technological disruption, there are organizational changes, and big multinationals on which we have uh, hitched our wagon have uh, been forced, including by environmental pressures, reducing uh, carbon footprints and so on, to consolidate um, production or think of consolidating production in the larger home uh, markets. So in, in our case, the models that we have relied on in the past, putting in more inputs to get more outputs rather than using existing inputs more efficiently. That's a low productivity problem, which is hinged to over-reliance on uh, cheap foreign labor. And continuing to do more and more and more doubling down on globalization, uh, on uh, subsidies, I would call them, to global corporations to encourage them to come to our country and 
and uh, invest at a time when the forces pushing them against doing that are stronger. So I think the pandemic has been very useful in showing that what economists have been talking about for 10 years, Singapore economists certainly, um, is here now. It was always here and we didn't acknowledge it. That's it. Uh, thanks, Linda. Uh, I, I thought you, know, you guys have pretty much said what I wanted to say. Uh, so, but I thought I'll pick up on uh, Charon's point, uh, first point about how this crisis reveals the failure of our institutions to deal with you know, well-known risks. I mean, the pandemic the, is not a black swan, all right? This is something which scenario planners, future risks, uh, public health professionals have reminded us uh, timelessly since the late 1990s. And with climate change, we can expect a lot more of this. I worked in the on, on behavioral economics and on the intersection between people's psychology and cognitive wow. limitations and the need for institutions to correct and compensate for those. Uh, and this crisis really reminds us, I think, that we live increasingly not just in, uh, uh, in, in the globalized economies, we also live increasingly in globalized societies. Uh, I just found out recently that from Wuhan and the airport in Wuhan, you can reach any point in the world within 36 hours, or at least that was when, uh, you know, flights were still operating. Uh, and we should really think of ourselves as, you know, all of us, all of us living a, along a giant global uh, communal stream, right? Uh, that, and, 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 and this communal stream represents whether you talk about pu global public health, uh, you talk about the global environment, global financial stability, dealing with this current pandemic, and of course, climate change mitigation. These are all problems of the global commons. And what this crisis reminds us, I think, is that even though we've become a lot more interconnected, interdependent, as both as globalized economies and as globalized societies, we have not developed the global shared norms and the collaborative, cooperative institutions that Kenneth was talking about to ensure sustainable use of these uh, global pool resources, these common pool resources. And, and over the last few weeks, I'm, I'm constantly reminded of... Uh, Eleanor's, Eleanor, Eleanor Ostrom's uh, groundbreaking work in how, you know, when we deal with these problems of uh, the global commons, neither the market nor governments, you know, provide uh, a perfect solution. And we really have to develop what she calls institutions, right? The rules, the shared norms, uh, and, and the shared governance systems, uh, collective governance systems that will ensure sustainable use of these uh, common pool resources. Uh, the second point I wanted to pick up on was on uh, Kenneth's uh, uh, emphasis, uh, you know, how, how as, as societies we've become increasing, as governments we've become increasingly fixated on uh, market-based uh, efficiency. Because what I'm reminded of also is Sanders ground, Michael Sanders' groundbreaking work on how we've not just become market economies, we've also become market societies where efficiency is valorized, sometimes as the only, uh, you know, metric of sound uh, uh, policy making, and I think in the Singapore context, this has become very salient. This has become very apparent uh, when many of us pointed out the limits uh, and 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 the inadequacies, and, and you know, really the deplorable state of uh, foreign worker housing. We, you know, I was surprised by how much pushback there was from uh, fellow Singaporeans, including well-meaning Singaporeans, who said, "Well, this is as good as it, it can be. The conditions are good enough." Right? And what they're really saying is that, you know, since we've decided to provide uh, foreign worker housing through the market, financed and provided by the market, the living conditions that are produced by the market are natural, are just, uh, are, are efficient. And I think, you know, as, as Sandow might say, we've, you know, reduced, we have um, replaced our social norms, our, our moral perspective on what constitutes uh, you know, acceptable or adequate uh, living standards or housing conditions with an entirely market norms. Uh, and I think this crisis should remind us that, you know, the market is not the only lens. Uh, efficiency is not the only thing uh, that matters for public policy making. And in fact, as, as, a, as somebody who works in complexity and on innovation, I think what we really want from the market is the, its ability to generate variety and its ability to promote uh, innovation. And we should like markets. I, I'm still a believer in market capitalism, but we should like market not because of its efficiency properties, but, you know, and, and this crisis has shown that efficiency clearly has its limits, but we should like markets because of its effectiveness in promoting innovation. I think I'll stop there and, and, and hear from the rest. <clears throat> okay. 
Um, thank you so much for that um, to everyone. I think everyone's pointed out a lot of the uh, structural issues that are underpin our system. Um, in in case in, in I, I think uh, all all of you are pointing out that um, these have been there for some time, and what the crisis has brought out is uh, what well, the crisis has just made them salient. Right, that some of these issues salient. Um, I'm going to add to this a little bit just by talking a little bit more about what the costs are or for whom or who bears the cost of these problems. So because I'm a sociologist who studies inequality, I've tried to emphasize two things that sound a little bit contradictory. And well, on one hand, the income and wealth differences among people in society means that people have very different opportunities, unequal choices, and uneven capacities to meet needs. Yet, on the other hand, inequality isn't just bad for people who have low income, but also bad for society as a whole, including those who are higher income. And I think the ongoing crisis has made this clearer that, that these both things are true. Yeah, that it's never been clearer that our overall health as a society is dependent on a lot more than the actions or well being of any single individual. And that when some members of our society are, are at higher risk for poor health, Everyone is affected. And yet, although this crisis obviously affects everybody, it is also clear that its impact is very different for different segments of our population. So in the past months in Singapore and across the world, it's become very obvious that the disease, although potentially affecting all bodies, regardless of wealth, has very different consequences on people across, uh, across socioeconomic lines. There's the obvious divide between people in white collar professions who are able to quickly shift to working from home and people in blue collar jobs that require continued physical presence outside the home. We see variations in terms of job security surfacing almost overnight. People in part-time work and the gig economy have seen immediate drops in daily, weekly, monthly incomes. People who have always lived quite precarious lives are now having difficulty meeting basic needs. We also see very quickly that um, aside from these variations that are along class lines, gender and ethno-national inequalities also matter. As countries go into lockdown, we see anew that the activities that had been taken for granted, shopping, cooking, cleaning, caring for children, caring for the elderly, caring for the disabled, all this is revealed as labor and labor that's disproportionately held by women both in families and also in the form of underpaid care work. Ethnicity and nationality also matter in various ways, partly because ethnic minorities are disproportionately overrepresented among the lower income, and also because ethnicity and nationality have historically, in Singapore as well as elsewhere, historically been the basis for prejudice and discriminatory practices that lead to lower access to public goods like healthcare or education, that lead to different access to specific forms of wage work. And ethno-nationality also differentiates access to the very possibility of making demands and being heard. So to sum up, this crisis may affect everybody in society, but people's experiences of it vary sharply. And the variations map onto the systemic inequalities that have always existed, that we've always had in society along class lines, along gender lines, along ethno-national lines. The crisis has amplified the vulnerabilities and precarity of those who are always vulnerable and precarious. And how these inequalities will play out, we cannot say with certainty now. And we need to understand some of the specifics through, uh, we need to understand the specifics better through long-term research. But the point of my starting with this is to emphasize that we must maintain inequality as lens in any analysis and discussion of the COVID-19 crisis, as well as our responses to it. Uh, so with that, actually, uh, let me move to the second question, uh, which is what can we expect in the next weeks, months, years? Uh, what will the fallout of this crisis be? And very importantly, how do you think we should think about how to mitigate some of the negative impacts of the COVID-19 crisis. If Does can, anyone want to start? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, I can just jump in since you spoke about inequality. I think what the crisis also shows is uh, the various forms that inequality can take. 
right? As, as an economist, I work mostly on income and wealth, sometimes on consumption inequality. And, and you, you as a sociologist obviously take a broader view uh, of inequality and, and the way it shapes, uh, you know, people's capacity to respond to crises like that, the way it shapes people's lived, daily lived experiences. And I think about the crisis is revealed is that inequality can take the form of spatial, uh, environmental health, uh, very obviously housing inequality. And I think going forward to pick up on your point about how we should keep inequality as a lens in this, uh, is to address, you know, for the Singapore government at least, to look at inequality in, in all its various forms, right? So that means not just inequality within Singaporean society, but also inequality between Singaporeans uh, and non-residents. And inequality, not just in terms of uh, income and wealth, but also in terms of uh, living conditions, housing, access to public goods, amenities, uh, and so on. So I think, uh, you know, going forward as policymakers, we really need to be a lot more sensitized uh, and a lot more attuned to inequality as a metric, uh, uh, social justice more broadly as, uh, as a uh, metric of good policymaking, not just growth and efficiency. Hmm. Why? Sorry, why? Why? why yeah, why, why should we prioritize social justice? Because as this crisis has shown, if you can't if you do not have an acceptable or adequate level of equality and social justice, even the growth, even the efficiency that you had prioritized couldn't be achieved, uh, you, right? Because, I mean, what is the most salient, the most vivid manifestation of inequality in Singapore? It is in the disparity between Singaporeans and foreign labor. And why is Singapore in lockdown? Uh, well, because of the inadequate uh, access and the inadequate protection that uh, foreign workers uh, suffered right uh, as uh, in, in this pandemic, and so we've we've had to pay a price, not just in inequality, but we've also had to pay a price in terms of uh, how quickly we uh, Singapore can go back into business as usual, how qu quickly mm -hmm. Singapore can resume uh, economic production. So if you do not have an adequate level of uh, uh, not just resilience but also social justice and equality, you pay a price uh, in, in efficiency eventually. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay. Kenneth, just now you, you Kenneth, you had mentioned uh, this as well about moral reasoning and all that. Could you do? Would, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I mean, moral reasoning is, of course, a very lofty thing, right? That needs you need capacities to 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 develop uh, uh, compasses for navigating very complex uh, problems and situations. So that's something I think to be built over uh, a medium term or long term, but. Um, very close to this sense of um, moral reasoning is also the moral sensibilities, right? That perhaps might have grown out of this experience too. I think it's not all bad, bad news, of course. Uh, we've also been able to see, uh, looking out there, uh, so much expression of generosity, of kindness, of people who uh, kind of come out of their shell, you know, kind of made use of whatever skills they have in order to help, right? And to be um, kind of uh, um, in a comforted way, uh, able to uh, uh, provide assistance to others without having to go the full way. And people are discovering uh, all the levels of activism that are available to them. And I think these are opportunities for developing empathy, uh, um, acquiring knowledge about things uh, that for a long time have been uh, hidden, uh, in, uh, made invisible, but these things have emerged uh, very sharply uh, through the crisis. And so coming face to face uh, with the crisis, but also face to face with the people uh, in the crisis and behind the crisis, I think creates a, a store of knowledge about the, co the real complexities and the textures of our society that may have been absent uh, for a lot of, of people growing up in a very cocooned uh, type of, of, of uh, um, uh, a space. So I, I think there's a lot of social capital that can be built out of this experience. People who've come out especially young people, you know, with a very positive sense of what can be done, uh, galvanizing uh, charitable energies, the, the, the energies of generosity in order to do good. But I, I also want to say that um, I worry a little bit also that if we kind of stop at that level, you know, stop at the level of just being kind and generous to others, uh, it, it, it may not uh, incentivize us on the whole to go further and, you um, uh, try and get change at the level of, of policy or legislation, right? 
Uh, what I mean by that is um, if, if we see that the current system has many cracks in it and uh, people fall through these cracks, but whenever they fall, there are kind and generous people out there to pick them up. Then people might say, so what's the problem, right? There's, there's, there's nothing inherently wrong with the system. And it might slow us down in terms of actually embracing more deeply the kind of structural and systemic changes that I, I think uh, need to, to be made. So the question was really about moral reasoning, but I, I think before we get to moral reasoning at that cognitive intellectual level, there is a sense in which the, 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 the moral feelings uh, 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 have had an opportunity uh, to, to, to develop and to emerge and to be expressed and to create social capital. But at the same time, uh, we might lose sight uh, um, of the real policies that need to be uh, changed. I might just uh, jump in and pick up a question that's come from the uh, audience. Uh, sticking with the topic of moral uh, reasoning, which means that the spotlight is still on you, Kenneth. Um, uh, yeah. Sarah, uh, uh, Sarah Ang asks, uh, given the importance of moral reasoning, do you see a role for it across disciplines and levels of education? Uh, how can we incorporate elements of social justice uh, for mass public? Yeah, there's so many ways of, of, of doing that, right? And, and probably the, the, the weakest approach for doing that, at least in, in curricular uh, terms, uh, is to simply teach people moral frameworks. Although, I mean, at least, at least you have that, right? So at the very... At, at the very start, I think people need to sort of understand the different uh, uh, paradigms, the different uh, lenses that are used to make moral sense of complex situations. So the kind of cognitive um, availability for, for, for people to, to um, kind of uh, uh, um, make sense out of a, a phenomena. But uh, I think that's insufficient because uh, it, it mustn't be a yet another technocratic exercise, right? Here's a complex problem and here are lenses for you to make sense of the problem and then you have an answer to it. I, I, I think um, this needs to be taken a bit further. Uh, uh, the experience of learning moral reasoning needs to be uh, exactly that, an experience, right? There's, there needs to be an experiential uh, level to this. So, I mean, there, there, there are courses in, in, in our universities, I think in our schools where students um, are actually sent out to engage with communities, with civil society organizations, with you know communities that are rarely seen or heard. Um, and uh, while so, these are occasions where moral reasoning can be exercised, right? So you could scaffold those experiences with with questions, with moral frameworks, just to get students uh, thinking about this. Uh, but because they come face to face with 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 real people, there's a lot more at stake. And so it, it, um, it kind of gets elevated from just a, a, an academic exercise to an exercise where, you know, there's a lot at stake, right? We're actually engaging with real people, with real concerns, and there's a responsibility in our, in our um, uh, interactions with people like that. So if we could organize more of these kinds of, of, of uh, courses where students go out, and it, obviously we need to refrain from... Uh, uh, conceptualizing of the, uh, uh, these things as a kind of, I don't know, poverty tourism or something like this, you know, just kind of send them out so that they can experience the hardships of another a community that's different from their own and then they come away feeling grateful or whatever. It mustn't be like that, right? That it, it, it needs to be directed, uh, you know, in a way that makes, gives them a real discomfort uh, about being in that space. And I think what's important also in efforts to um, you know, really kind of uh, uh, learn moral reasoning is to understand that um, these communities that we engage with are not simply objects of our analysis, but they are subjects, right? They are people with, with voices, and those voices may have been silenced uh, for all kinds of reasons. And I think one of the, 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 the most important learning um, uh, uh, goals uh, that we could design in these, these uh, courses is for students and professors to work with these communities uh, in a collaborative way, uh, not in a way that suggests we are there to solve their problems or to work with them. And I think that, you know, that starting point of giving the communities we engage with voice and agency, if we, if we kind of, if we kind of um, uh, translated that uh, uh, in, 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 in the activism that we do, 
with uh, communities in need and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I think that would make a big difference, right? If we were to engage with the migrant workers, for example, in this very specific problem of the dormitories, you know, I mean, uh, we, we've hardly heard their voices in the solutioning type of uh, work that, that's been uh, presented in public. Where, where, where are their voices, right? Where is their creativity? Uh, where where is their agency in expressing what the what the problems really are? You know what what you know we we need to to have enough faith, right? <laughs> that uh, um, uh, people on the margins uh, have a voice, they have creativity, they have agency, and I think that's a very important lesson to learn uh, in 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 developing the capacities for moral reasoning. Uh, Linda, can I? I'll ask you a question that perhaps you could work into your answer, which is this. Uh, I mean, when I hear uh, inequality, the solution is obviously some kind of redistribution, um, uh, which I assume would have some cost on, it, it would mean taking the um, your foot off the pedal of uh, economic growth uh, rather than maximizing growth all the time. It's, I assume it's going to have some cost to that. Uh, the the argument um, has uh, that the government has always made is that given how little control we have over the global economy, uh, given uh, the fact that we can't really pick the growth rates we uh, have from year to year, the smart thing to do is to make hay while sun shines, uh, just grow as fast as we can when we can, because we will need those reserves um, when times are bad. And couldn't it be argued that... Um, its uh, formula is actually proving its value right now. The, the fact that it is able to, um, uh, to, to pile sort of endless tons of money behind this problem now, it can throw money at the problem, is precisely because it resisted uh, sort of left-wing calls for more risk redistribution in the past and emphasized growth. What would your answer be to that? We have to ask, first of all, where does inequality come from, right? Why do we have inequality? And inequality comes from the econo economic model that we choose to follow, which uh, tends to reward um, capital more than labor. <laughs> and, uh, and that this comes from the input intensive model. Let's go out and attract uh, investment since no, we assume that nobody will come to Singapore unless we give them goodies, so we give them goodies, right? So we have, and that's why uh, uh, profits or surplus is a very large chunk of the Singapore economy. A big part of inequality comes from the fact that wages and consumption, domestic consumption, are very small, are very low proportions of GDP by global standards, right? So consumption is in Singapore, it's about 40% of our GDP, domestic consumption, which is very low by uh, international uh, standards. And, uh, and um, wages are also uh, like about 45% um, of GDP. So you have to go and look into that rather than, so I think it's a fundamental economic model rather than, oh, let's just let this unequal model go, keep going and keep going and rewarding some people more than others, and then uh, tax and redistribute, right? And that's the, your, the whole redistribution uh, argument. I think we need to think more about how we can not privilege a model that generates inequality. To get back to the specifics, on reserves okay, and being able to spend. Uh, first of all, um, reserves have not been a constraint in this pandemic globally on how other governments spend, right? Every government, the United States, which has a huge deficit, right? Trillions of dollars, it can go out and borrow. Okay, United States might be special, but other countries also, you can borrow the market at zero and even negative <laughs> rates of interest today. So that shows that you don't need to build up reserves for 30 years in order to spend them uh, in three months, right? Where do reserves come from? Reserves come from the lack of the repressed consumption uh, of people in the past, okay? 
people in the past had low consumption, high savings, okay, for a variety of reasons. And so the private sector saves more than it invests. So we have actually suppressed the consumption of pioneer generation, Madeka generation, and so on, when they were much poorer than we are now. Okay, so we took, uh, we suppressed through, through wage policy, um, forced savings, et cetera, we suppressed the consumption and living standards of people in the past, built up these huge reserves, which what did we do with them? We invested them overseas in uh, benefiting foreign shareholders, foreign bondholders, and so on, right? And then we, would you, why would you do that going forward, right? We have huge uh, reserves. We have run budget surpluses. What is a budget surplus? Budget surplus is government taking from people more than it gives back to them, right? That's it. So do we want to have this forever? For the government taking resources, however you cut from people, putting them overseas, just in case, you know, there's going to be a pandemic and then we can bring a small fraction of that money back. No, I think we have to be much more fundamental and structural in how we think about the economy going forward. This is not a short term cyclical issue. This is a long term structural issue that we have evaded simply by riding this high growth policy. It was 1972 when Dr. Go Keng Sui said we had to reduce our dependence on foreign labor. And then I think Tony Tan said it again, 85. We've known these problems for decades, but we got hooked into a model because for some time it generated growth and high returns for some people. We know that that model has been sputtering for years now. Our growth by churning out more and more labor to try and produce, we have diminished something economists call diminishing returns. We've reached that point of diminishing returns even before the pandemic. So we do need a fundamental rethink and I'll stop there for now and give you the ideas later. Yeah, I just, I, I just also want to add that if we don't act collectively now, that there will be great hardship ahead for people who are already struggling. Um, but because of the scale of this current crisis that we're in, it also seems obvious that that, um, that population is going to grow. The population of people who are going to face hardship is going to grow, right, after this crisis, because we know that jobs are already being lost and that the likelihood of jobs and, and wages going down is, is, is high, right, from where we're standing now, looking uh, ahead. And so this is not going to be sort of a problem that, you know, I mean, that so far we, we've been able to say it's a minority. Yeah, I, I think that it is going to be a, a growing problem that people are, are going to face hardship, right? And we do have to mitigate these impacts at least partly through reforms in our social policy regime, right? Because social policies are meant to correct some of the irrationalities of the market. Yeah, and some of the, by irrationalities, I, I mean, you know, that that certain things are, are highly rewarded, uh, but those are not necessarily the things that necessarily bring the most value to humans, right? And that many important uh, roles and many important jobs are not necessarily right, highly rewarded uh, through the market. And so our social policies cannot map onto that, which they do to a great degree now. You know, your access to, to good education, your access to healthcare, your access to housing, all of this is so deeply tied up with employment and so deeply tied up to wages. Yeah? And so deeply tied up, I might add, also to very narrow definitions of the family. And I think that fundamentally does have to shift in order to allow more people to be able to meet needs and to be able to flourish as humans, right? And for us as a society to flourish. Um, in some of my work, I have emphasized that social policies, besides, um, besides, I suppose, meeting very specific needs and giving very specific material, sort of transforming very material consequences, is that they also have very important symbolic um, and cultural meaning embedded in them, right? And one of the things I've talked about in my work is how there is a deep sense of differentiated deservedness yeah, in our so social well, uh, 
policy regime. And also this, this, this relationship between state and society that I, that I call neoliberal morality, where the relationship between state and society is quite an individualistic one. And people are compelled to think in terms of what shall I do for myself and what shall I do for my family. And there's very thin sense of mutual obligations, very thin sense of lateral ties across society. And I think it, it really is important that our institutions uh, be reformed in a way, right? So that that is not the case, so that that is not the emphasis where people are sort of thinking only in terms of how do I meet my own needs? How do I, you know, make sure that I can take care of myself and, and my family uh, in, instead of thinking in terms of we're contributing to the commons and that when, 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 um, when overall more people can, can meet their needs and flourish, then that is good for our society and we want to contribute to that. I'll stop there. Actually, maybe I'll just ask this question to the others also, because this came up earlier too, that you talked about institutionalized institutions and the importance of institutions. Um, so maybe you wanna comment on that as well. Anyone? Um, if I could just uh, elaborate on that, because I think one thing that you highlighted, uh, Yuyen, was the uh, uh, surprising, well, surprising to me, maybe, maybe not to everyone, uh, lack of how should I say community spiritedness, uh, whatever you know, whatever this glue is that is supposed to bring us together, which is the reason why we need institutions, right? I mean, I, I've been thinking that this actually um, contradicts the story that Singaporeans have been telling ourselves that we are this uh, communitarian, non-individualistic society. Right? I mean, we've we've been uh, fed that from uh, a tender age, right? That what distinguishes us from these uh, uh, liberal democracies is that they are individualistic, we are communitarian. Um, there's no evidence that uh, Singaporeans are demonstrating any more or less uh, social cohesiveness or unselfishness or community spiritedness than any other people in the world. Uh, uh, comes down to it, we are capable of generosity, but we're also capable of great uh, kiasu selfishness in you know, the works, right? Uh, so, so what happened to this idea of communitarian spirit? And, and it got me thinking that really um, we've been using the term wrongly. What we understand by uh, communitarianism really is just looking after our own. It's family values. Mm -hmm. It's looking after people like us. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and if that's all there is to it, well, frankly, uh, the human species is hardwired to do that. You know, we don't <laughs> actually need ideology or the PAP or anyone uh, to tell us to put family first and those we care about and who are like us first. Uh, every community has done that um, and continues to do that. Um, I don't know. We've got a law, haven't we, in Singapore that allows people to uh, people to sue their children if they don't look up. <laughs> that's right. So it shows that even that is not that strong. Right? <laughs> but I think what this and other crises show is that, uh, in fact, this uh, desire to look after our own doesn't actually scale up. We're not very good at scaling up from uh, looking after our families uh, to looking after strangers. And any city of the size of more than 5 million, in fact, any community that is probably more than 100 or 200 people, uh, needs to develop the skill of or the instincts to look after strangers. Uh, that is really what the entire human rights revolution was about. Uh, that is that is the what is novel in the human experience of the last uh, no more than 100 years. The earlier bit is easy. Look after people who are like us that we identify with. Uh, Singaporeans do that well because every society does that well. Uh, but I think what this crisis exposes is that we have not actually, um, it's not true that the family is a microcosm of the nation, uh, that there's a gap. We look after our families, but hey, we're not that good, look, uh, uh, that good at looking after strangers and hence the need for institutions and hence the need for uh, some other kind of social compact that encourages us uh, to look after, uh, to show compassion for individuals just because they're human beings, not because they're Chinese or Indian, not because of their nationality mm. and so on. We've been pretty bad at that. I think this uh, crisis has, uh, you know, it's forcing us to realize. Well, but it's also the case that society never really had a chance to develop those intermediate uh, institutions, right, between 
families and the state between private mm. firms and, and government. Uh, and so Singapore has just got this, right, this, the usual, the, the, the dichotomy between a very strong state uh, and, and a relatively weak society, right, because we've not developed the, the, organ, the, the institutions, uh, the civil institutions, the, the, the civil society that usually defines, right, the space between uh, uh, mm -hmm. state and private individuals and families. Uh, I mean, the work that I've been reading on uh, uh, S.A. McGlue and uh, Robinson's The Narrow Corridor, that he says that what allows societies to progress, what, you know, what the system that allows us to keep uh, our freedoms and our liberties while constraining an overly strong uh, authoritarian government would be, you, you need strong civic institutions, you need a strong society to complement uh, a, a strong government. And, and, and having been in Hong Kong, I mean, uh, Sharon, you've been here longer. And I've been struck by how over time the Hong Kong government has really become quite paralyzed, has become weaker, right? Has, has become, uh, you know, characterized by inertia, has been trapped on all sides. Uh, but it's got a relatively strong society, right? Uh, it's capable of self-organization, for, for better or for worse. I mean, the protest might be a sign that it is capable of self-mobilization for the wrong things. But uh, during this particular pandemic, you could see how society was able to come up with all the right responses collectively, right? Uh, in, in, in a sort of self-organizing emergent way. Uh, and, and, and that was what helped Hong Kong society. Every Hong Kong person I've spoken to and I, when I asked them, why do you think Hong Kong has done relatively well in this crisis? Nobody credits the Hong Kong government. Although I think the government has done a reasonably good job. Uh, it's listened to experts. It's you know it's taken the, on board the the advice of uh, you know public health uh, and uh, professionals and scientists. Uh, but everybody says it's the community response that has uh, really explained that that's really behind. You know, they knew right from the start they had to practice social distancing. They had to practice you know better standards of personal hygiene. They had to put on masks. At the initial stages, uh, the, the Hong Kong government uh, carried on. Actually, tried to discourage people from. From wearing masks and and the back, the public backlash was so strong she had to she had to backtrack from that so I think you know in in in, in when you're dealing with uh, complex complex problems like this it really helps to have a diverse strong societal response uh, and if you rely only on elites in government government making the right calls uh, well if if they get it right you're lucky and but more likely than not because this is such a complex wicked problem more likely than not uh, they'll get something's wrong and and you need to have compensating mechanisms and you know and i think all the literature in uh, political science tells us that compensating set of institutions is a strong society that's able to mobilize organize and uh, uh, and compensate for the state's errors and mistakes so donald you, you are you are aware you're treading on dangerous ground because you're making international and intercity comparisons and if we've, we've learned one thing from the social media discussions over the last uh, couple of months is that most Singaporeans do not take kindly to any such comparison, unless, of course, uh, it results in Singapore being number one. Uh, <laughs> if <laughs> Singapore <laughs> appears not so uh, strong in these comparisons, there's stiff resistance uh, from our establishment, uh, from elite, uh, from those in the elite, as well as armies of uh, their supporters online. Uh, is this a problem? I think it's a problem if it, well, I generally take the point that we shouldn't compare, right? Our contexts are very different, but it is a problem when, you know, when those rankings and comparisons suit Singaporean uh, mental models, right? So suit Singaporeans' uh, perspectives of superiority. Those comparisons are, are, are you know, are welcome, they are embraced, you know, they, we, they are, you know, see how, how well we are doing, we are gold standard. And when those comparisons, uh, you know, flip, uh, suddenly, we take on this. Uh, oh, we are unique. We are, you know, you, you can't compare. We are, a, we are a city state, not just a city. Uh, and and I think I think what gets to me is the. I mean, this is just outright blatant hypocrisy, isn't it? Let's call it what it is. So either you say right, let's not compare right from the start. Whether you even when you were doing well, or if you're going to embrace comparisons, and I'm not comparing. I'm just saying my experience in Hong Kong, right? And what reasonable, pro uh, plausible lessons we can draw from Hong Kong. Uh, there are many things wrong with Hong Kong society. I mean, just today, uh, the protests, uh, there was a protest just you know, five minutes down from where I am, all right? Uh, so the moment, so Hong Kong is trapped between a summer of protests and when, you know, the cold months come again, uh, the pandemic might return. So it's trapped between the protests and the pandemic. Uh, 
so so you know, we don't want to learn that from Hong Kong, certainly. But I think uh, back to your question, uh, uh, Chair, we, we really should be a lot more humble and and self aware that you know that there are things we could you know uh, usefully learn, right? Uh, usefully benchmark ourselves to, uh, and and I think what uh, the experience here shows is that you know you you do need compensating institutions when the state doesn't always get it right. And those compensating institutions have to come from bottom up. Actually, this is something that I feel kind of uh, strongly about, you know, this, um, the use of, uh, of nationalist uh, rhetoric. You know, it, it seems that um, the, uh, you know, whether it's against the Hong Kong government, which I think is uh, low hanging fruit, because it's not hard to be more capable than the Hong Kong <laughs> government, uh, or uh, snide remarks about the Taiwanese people, right? or uh, encouraging its uh, online trolls to treat uh, domestic critics as if they're anti-national. Um, this, this worries me because I think the PAP establishment is making the mistake of thinking that this is just harmless uh, political rhetoric. Uh, but you know, there's a big difference between cultivating uh, sort of an inclusive uh, patriotism, which I think is very good, uh, from an exclusive nationalism, which is uh, uh, pretty dangerous. Uh, the, the government seems to assume that it is uh, it can separate the two, right? It can separate harmless us versus them ways of thinking uh, from dangerous us versus them ways of thinking. Uh, but the, the reason I'm worried about this is because it's not in fact that easy to separate. You know, once you get people thinking in these yeah. um, exclusivist uh, nationalist ways, I fear not even the PAP government will be able to put the uh, genie back in the bottle, right? I'm, I'm not, I mean, of course, what we've seen over the last few years is a rise of uh, in what uh, Kenneth referred to as authoritarian uh, populism and demog demagoguery and so on, right, uh, around the world. I'm not suggesting that the PAP itself is going to uh, turn fascist, but, you know, we live in a very porous uh, region. Uh, what's happening in India right now is frightening, right? Uh, we are seeing something akin to what happened in the, uh, uh, the how the Great Depression uh, caused, uh, you know, massive, uh, not just dislocations, but to the extent of genocides, right? Um, I'm not saying it's going to get there, but we should be paying more attention to what's, uh, what's going on in the, uh, on the Indian right. There's um, open scapegoating of Muslims, uh, uh, who are being, it's, and it's claimed that uh, Muslims are causing the virus or spreading the virus in India and so on, on mainstream media by mainstream politicians. Um, do we really think that this is not going to affect Singapore? I mean, th these are uh, scary thoughts that I think we should be thinking about. So frankly, I think it is uh, irresponsible for the PAP to, uh, to be using this kind of uh, rhetoric. Uh, we, should, uh, we should not be paying, playing the nationalist uh, populist game uh, as if we're immune from these forces. Yeah? Uh, we, we should be instead be, I think, inoculating ourselves against these ways of thinking, uh, not tilling the ground for others to sow the, uh, the, the seeds of hate, uh, stop talking about critics as if they're anti-national, stop encouraging us versus them attitudes, uh, uh, because these are forces that have run out of control in the region pretty close. Uh, and it's not guaranteed that we can keep those, uh, the spillover effects at bay. Can I jump in here because I'm also mindful of time to um, sort of pose this last question that's starting to come up about, about civil society, about uh, how it can go different ways also, yeah, in terms of uh, political directions, and ask you to address the, the final question. What, what do you think um, we as, as scholars, as members of society, as part of civil society, what can we do to generate the conditions we need for the changes that we want to see? Linda, shall we start with you? Yes, well, I think, um, you know, I believe in, <laughs> specialization according to comparative advantage. I think that for academics, we need to continue to do our research, do our teaching, do our public education, all of which are part of the role of an academic. And we should not be afraid to research and to speak out on issues such as the ones we have discussed today 
um, and share our expertise, uh, share mm -hmm. our opinions. That's as academics, but we also have a role as uh, civil society actors, right? And I think that I, I was struck by something that came up earlier, which is certainly what I see in the US, okay? not like what you see in the newspapers, is a lot of spontaneous grassroots initiative, self-organizing uh, capabilities, not from any formal institutions, but when something happens, people say, I have got to go to help and I'm going to do that. Large numbers of people, they very quickly organize themselves. It's not individual charity. Uh, and I think that that is one of the things which makes a society resilient, right? Between, there was a question earlier that um, on the chat, between state and market private firms, what is there? There is community action. And for that, you need strong communities including communities who get, can transcend the us versus them that Charion so eloquently put out. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Donald, Donald? Yeah, I think, and I'm just picking up on Charion's point where, you know, as part of this rise of uh, authoritarian populism, there's also been almost universally, certainly in uh, West uh, uh, democratic societies, this rejection of experts, right? That, you know, social media has given rise to the view that my personal experience, my personal opinion counts more than you know, has, has more has mm. more credence than uh, than what experts say. You know, as uh, Michael Gove so famously or rather infamously says, I think this country has had enough of experts. I think Singapore isn't there yet, but you can certainly see the the, the seeds that are being planted that might eventually lead to that kind of disdain of institutions, disdain of uh, experts. And I think this is why, as uh, social scientists and as scholars, we need to step up and counter those. Uh, and, and we need to make ourselves heard because one way, one sure way we will get to that kind of disdain and rejection of experts is if we, if we keep silent, right? And we let uh, public discourse and we let uh, social media be dominated by ignorant, ignorant uh, they may be well-meaning, but ignorant uh, voices. And, 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 and I think we need to let our expertise and our knowledge uh, inform uh, a shape, guide the public debate, even if we, sh we should not abrogate to ourselves as scholars uh, the right to make policy or make decisions, uh, but we should in certainly inform the public discourse and the public debate. Thanks. Kenneth? Um, so the question is why, uh, uh, what can academics do? Uh, and maybe I, the way I think about it is why isn't there more uh, intervention from, from, from academics outside of so their own sort of cloistered uh, uh, preoccupations. And uh, um, there are several answers to that. One is, you know, a lot of academics are naturally quite reclusive, but um, uh, it, 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 it doesn't help also that uh, in the Singapore context, uh, there's a bit of nervousness about how things that you contribute in the public might be read and how it might be, you know, whether it's from the state or whether it's from trolls or whether it's from, you know, this kind of, um, uh, increasing some sort of intolerance um, uh, or, or maybe a rejection, as Donald says, uh, of, of elite uh, um, uh, pronouncements in public, by academics, for example. So there's a nervousness about going public, right? But there's also the preoccupation in academia uh, to do a certain kind of research that, um, uh, you know, that views public intervention as a distraction, right? And here, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking of how our universities are themselves being subjected to neoliberalization. We, we like it or not, we, we work in neoliberal universities and their priorities are quite different, right? Some of us may have more luxury to, to uh, spend our academic time uh, in, in more socially impactful or policy impactful work. But for many people, the system itself has rendered them precarious. So a lot of young academics, for example, struggle, right? And the competitiveness that has also infected uh, university cultures uh, has ripped apart a lot of the collegiality that supports, um, you know, kind of moral solidarity, a kind of, a, um, you know, kind of mutually supporting uh, uh, a type of environment that allows young academics and older academics to, to, to thrive. So I think we're seeing less and less of that in the university environment and it makes it very hard uh, for people to make that decision, uh, risky decision, to um, devote their attention and energy to anything other than doing the kind of quick research that generates quick results that gets you sort of um, published in the kinds of publications, the narrowing uh, list of publications 
publication types that the universities here in Singapore and I suppose elsewhere uh, actually care about. So, so actually being much more interventionist in things beyond the academic circles is actually having to swim against the, the tide. And for some, it's, a, it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very rough tide, right? So I, I guess what we need to do uh, is to, uh, those of us who can afford it, to, 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 to be as, especially generous in the way that we build collegiality within our departments and within our faculties, um, to shelter younger uh, academics who are doing very important socially beneficial, socially impactful work, but whose work may not necessarily be viewed favorably by uh, the, 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 the metrics of a neoliberal university. I, I think it's got to start by, uh, by strengthening uh, our own scholarly environments. Thank you. Um, maybe I should go first so that uh, Sharon can um, also wrap up after he comments. Um, I, I think what Kenneth, you point to is that there's a certain institutionalization of our lack of engagement, right? That it's not an accident, right? That it's institutionalized that, that we, don't en we don't engage as much as we, we want to or we should. Um, and I, I do think that it is important to, to, to do it, um, uh, not, not just because it is right, and I think it, it is part of our professional duty to do, but also I am worried, like Donald is, about this sense of sort of anti-expertise, uh, anti-knowledge kind of, kind of uh, trend globally, right? And I, th I think we're, we're not quite in that state, but it is something that that's the real slippery slope we should be, we should be quite worried about. And, and so we really have to, to pedal really hard against, against that way we can. I would add that uh, one of the things that we can do is to try to build more ties and alliances outside of academia um, with other people who are in the civil society space, right? With, with people in the arts, with people who are activists um, and to try to build in some ways you know, communities there, right, where we feel that uh, we, we, we can learn things, we can build alliances, we can, you know, take risks alternately, right, uh, or, or spread out the risks um, uh, where, where possible. And I think that there are a lot of diverse strengths that we can tap on when we reach outside of academia to build these links, you know, with other people. And so this is not this is not anything that's going to be institutionalized and not anything that a young academic is going to easily find themselves automatically doing as a, as a part of their day job. And so it will take a lot of really explicit attention and purposeful action to do, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but, I, but I also think personally, for me, my experience has been that that is one of the richest sites, you know, uh, and, and most promising areas um, for, for, for growing this space. Um, I just want to emphasize also that the push for social change is not just push for different outcomes. It's also push for different process that can open the way to different outcomes, right? And so I often get asked, you know, particularly by younger people, do you feel hopeful about change? Yeah, and um, I, I think that we're not necessarily going to see all the outcomes that we want to see in terms of social justice, but we still need to be part of building that process and expanding that space where we can in order to get to that point, right? So I think that the current pandemic is a little bit of um, like a flood, you know, and the flood waters opens the door, right? But then when the flood recedes, that door is going to shut again. So we, we really do somehow have to sort of you know, keep our bodies against that door and keep that door open uh, when the flood recedes. I'll stop there. Thanks. Well, uh, yeah, as Yujian said, we should be uh, wrapping up, um, not for our sake, because you know, one thing you have to understand about uh, all five of us is that we're fully capable of giving a two hour lecture without taking a breath, right? But uh, we're not going to inflict that on you tonight. Uh, it is Friday night. Um, and we would like to imagine all of us, I think, that uh, being Friday night, uh, you know, we could go out and have plans after this, even though we won't, uh, given the circumstances. <laughs> but in wrapping up and in answering uh, Yuyen's question, you know, I, I'm going to uh, echo what other panelists have said. 
that uh, you know, basically that we will sink or swim together uh, and that the kind of collaboration uh, we need is probably more than just uh, clapping together or singing together. Uh, of course, individual morale is important, community spirit is vital, uh, and we're not going to preserve our humanity without love and compassion. Uh, but we are also an advanced economy and a complex society. Uh, and I think one thing we've been, all five of us have been trying to say in different ways, is that we're not going to solve these problems ahead by marching in lockstep, or to use one of the PAP's favorite metaphors, uh, rowing in rhythm because we're all in the same boat. Um, and that's true whether leaders are dangerous, delusional demagogues like Donald Trump or benign technocrats like we have in the Singapore government. Uh, we're we're going to address uh, collective problems when people are able to apply their own special skills and expertise. Uh, you know, so not just um, you know helping hands and uh, helping hearts, but also helping heads. Uh, you know, from their own disciplinary or professional training. Uh, whether these are doctors or primary school teachers or tradesmen, uh, Singaporeans have a lot to offer uh, beyond just their hearts and their hands. Um, Academia SG came together a year ago because we feel as scholars that our various fields have something to add to that mix. Uh, we hope more academics will be part of these larger societal and global conversations and even more importantly, we hope non-academics will engage with us, not just to listen to what we have to say, but to nudge us uh, towards the strong questions that really matter to the wider society. Uh, so that's why it's been uh, so encouraging to have so many of you uh, join us this evening. Uh, just as more Singaporeans can't sit down to a good meal uh, without licking their lips in anticipation of future meals. Uh, we hope this event uh, whets your appetite for conversations like these uh, and that you will delve into the buffet of scholarly writing on this pandemic and other key issues. Our own outlet at academia.sg is always open. Uh, so come explore our menu of local fare lovingly prepared by our small but growing movement of academic focus. Uh, th there's a branch right there on your device, no reservations required, exempt from all social uh, distancing regulations and totally free. <laughs> uh, so uh, thanks to our hosts at Hong Kong Baptist University, uh, to Eve, Minot, Abby, and our indispensable IT office. And finally, on behalf of our guest panelists, Donald Lowe and Kenneth Tan, uh, my Academia SG co-founders, uh, Linda Lim, Tio Yu Yen, as well as Ian Chong, who I guess is having breakfast somewhere in Harvard. Uh, our assistant editor, Jolene Tan. All of us thank you for joining us. Uh, stay safe and uh, do it by staying informed. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.